sick. It's 10 o'clock in the morning and you're at it already. Thought you were at work. I were. Came back to check on me. Not especially. And there's dishes in the sink. It's having seen a drop of water this week no more. So? And the kids. He didn't bring them to school in that get up, I hope. Stacia from. Did they have their breakfast? Of course they did. What do you take me for at all? Only ask him, Portia. Well, don't, all right? If you're not worried about the money, mind them yourself. And you'll go out and earn the money. If you never earned another penny, we'd still be rich. Do you want tea? No. Nah. Busy at the factory. Hi. It's my birthday today. Is that so? Thirty. Half my life's over. Ah, me heart goes out to you. <laughs> At this hour, you must be out of your mind. Slanche. This way I came back this morning. Happy birthday, Portia. Did you know? Why not? Thanks, Raphael. It's lovely. Portia. What? What's wrong with you? Nothing. Nothing. I better get back. But that's the more safe. It's after setting me back five grand. Well, 
I think he's guilty and I know he is. I have a right. Yes, you have a right. I gave you my arguments. I said what I need to say. The kid is guilty. We're not convinced. We'd like to hear your arguments again. We have time. You people aren't going to intimidate me. It's going to have to be a hung jury and that's it. Well, there's nothing we can do about that except hope that some night, maybe in a few months, why you might get some sleep. You're all alone. It takes a great deal of courage to stand alone. If it is a hung jury, there will be another trial, and some of us will point these things out to various <laughs> lawyers. What do you mean? You're the man. I'm not alone. You made all the arguments. You can't leave me now. A guilty man, a murderer. He's going to be left walking the street. You've got to stay with me here. I'm sorry. I'm convinced now. I don't think I'm wrong often, but I guess I was this once. There is a reasonable doubt in my mind. We're waiting. All right. All right. must be Charles Haversham. I'm sorry, this all must have given you a damn shock. It did. We're all still reeling. Naturally. Are any of you the deceased immediate family? I'm Cecil Haversham. I'm his brother. I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm Florence Collymore. I'm his fiance. Tonight was our engagement party. Oh, what a damn sad thing. I take it everyone is assembled in here, correct? Yes, the only other member of staff is Arthur the gardener, and I saw him leave the grounds with Winston hours ago. Winston? His guard dog. I see. Very well. Listen, gentlemen, you all must be distraught, but forgive me. The sooner I can begin my inquiries, the sooner we can all get to the bottom of this ghastly business. If you'd be so kind to take the body up to his study so I can examine it. Uh, yes, Inspector. Then lock all doors to the house and prepare this room. I'll conduct my inquiries down here afterwards. Inspector. I'll lend you a hat, there is. Inspector. Any ideas on the cause of death? No, oh, it could be a number of things. Suffocation, strangulation, poison. Ugh. Before fully examining the body, I wouldn't like to say. How could someone do it? Oh, try not to think about it, Miss Collymore. Once I've finished my inquiries upstairs, I'll speak to you each individually, and then perhaps you'll get some space to calm your nerves. Thank you, Inspector. This is all more than I can bear. I'll return presently, as soon as I've finished examining the body. Whenever you're ready, gentlemen. Please take time, gentlemen. <laughs> just, just, just go ahead. Just go. Just go. Just go. Just go. <laughs> just go. Just go. Just go. Just go. <laughs> As I said before, as soon as I have finished examining the body! Unbelievable! <laughs> what is going on? Thank God they've gone. Such a pain. 
Oh, couldn't not. Indeed. <laughs> Close his damn eyes, Perkins. You and I are having an affair. So what? It doesn't mean we killed him. Of course not, but that's what the inspector will think. It's fine. We'll just carry on as if everything's just as oh my God. As just as it was. Except now you won't be forced to marry my beastly brother. And soon we can be together and not keep secrets. But please, Rons, while we're here, let me do one quick kiss. Cecil, we can't. If we're caught, it would be the end. It's so strange to think of Charles being dead. He was such an influence on all our lives. <laughs> <laughs> still alive in the room, of course. His uh, stillness unnerves me. Oh, seeing a cadaver for the first time. Can be unsettling, Perkins. I need you to help me dust his personal belongings for fingerprints. Check his pockets, Thomas. Ah, of course, Inspector. Right. <clears throat> I need you, boy. It's not there. What? It's, it's <laughs> not talking about. It's not there. I, I told him. I told him. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Now to dust the body for fingerprints. What was that, Inspector? Sir? I could have sworn I just saw him breathing. Breathing, sir? Nonsense, Collymore. This man is dead! Oh. <laughs> He's cold. <coughs> lifeless. No, you're right. Dead and gone. <coughs> I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You're the most earnest looking man I have ever met. It's perfectly absurd you saying your name isn't Ernest. It's here on your cards. Oh, Mr. Ernest Worthing, B for the Albany. I'll keep this as proof that your name is Ernest if ever you attempt to deny it. To me, or to Gwendolyn, or to anybody else. You must know. My name is Jack in the country. And Ernest in town. And that cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that does not account for the fact that your small Aunt Cecily, who lives in Tunbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle. Now come, old boy, you'd much better have the thing out at once. And I may mention, I have always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret Bunburyist. And now, I am quite sure of the fact. What's a Bunburyist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you reveal to me why you are Ernest in town and Jack in the country. We'll produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now, produce your explanation and pray make it improbable. My explanation's not improbable at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. The late Thomas guarded you made me, in his will, guardian to Cecily called you. Cecily, who calls me her uncle out of motives of respect that you couldn't possibly understand, lives in my place in the country, under her admiral governess, Miss Prison. Where is that place in the country, by the way? I'm not telling you that, old boy. I may tell you quite candidly, though, it's not in Shropshire. Ah, I suspected that, my dear fellow. I've bundled all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? When one is put in the position of guardian, one adapts a high moral tone. And adapting a high moral tone does not favour good for one's happiness or health. To ensure I do have a happiness and health, I have made a useful brother by the name of Ernest who gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That's it, Archie. That's the truth. Pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. <laughs> modern life would be tedious if it were either. And modern literature a complete impossibility. <laughs> that wouldn't be such a bad thing. Literary criticism is not your forte, dear fellow. Don't try it. 
Leave that to the people who haven't gone to university. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you really are is a Bunburyist. I was quite right in saying you were a Bunburyist. You are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What is a Bunburyist? You have invented a very useful younger brother by the name of Ernest in order that you may be able to come up to town whenever you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid by the name of Bunbury, in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. You see, for instance, if it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinarily bad health, I wouldn't be able to dine with you tonight at Willis's, for I have really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You're absurdly careless about sending out invitations. That is very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving an invitation. I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, merely around £130,000 in the funds. That is all, Lady Bracknell. So good to have seen you. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, a moment, a moment. Oh, yes, I'm staying. £130,000. Well, Miss Cardew seems an attractive young lady now that I look at her. <laughs> Come over here, dear. Turn around. Oh, pretty child. Your dress is sadly simple. Hmm. And your hair, almost as nature might have left it. <laughs> <laughs> but we can soon alter all of that. A thoroughly experienced French maid produces a really marvellous result in a very brief space of time. I remember recommending one to a young lady lancing, and after three months, her own husband didn't know her. And after six months, nobody knew her. <laughs> <laughs> Kindly turn round, sweet child. No, 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 the side view is what I want. Yes, quite as I expected. The two weak points of our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. The chin a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on how the chin is worn, and they are worn very high, just at present. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the most wonderful and beautiful girl I have ever saw. I don't care tuppence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. 